Jeff, can you hear me back there? Good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse Roman. For those of you who are here for the first time, I'm the chair of the Department of Medicine. And as every year, we start the first round rounds of the academic year uh, by the chair delivering some hopefully useful and inspiring uh, comments. 2009, September, four years ago, I sat among you while Dr. Edwin Halperin, the dean of the medical school at that time, introduced me. It was my first introduction to this family. And I learned that there were three traditions. One was that um, every year you would have the first Grand Rounds presentation by the chair of the Department of Medicine, and that was I, that's the reason I was there in September. And there were other traditions that I've learned over time, but we have extended those traditions in two ways. Three ways, I would say. One is that I would sit always on front to ensure that you understood how important it was for me that you be here. That this time of the week is a time for us to come together as a family and to provide a face to this department, to our colleagues, to our students, to uh, the world, frankly. Number two, I always introduced the speaker or gave some words before the speaker to tell you a little bit about history, about somebody who did something special on this very day. And I did that and will continue to do so, not only to emphasize the importance of research and what we do, but also to emphasize the fact that what we do at the clinic and in the hallways of this hospital and uh, at HOC and in other places where we participate in care is very much influenced by the work hard work and sacrifice of a lot of men and women who came before us, and that's important that we uh, remember that because hopefully a lot of what we do today will influence the people who come after us. And the third tradition we have expended on is the format in which this lecture is delivered every year. What I've chosen to do is to introduce a concept, introduce um, a challenge, a problem. Then the second part of the lecture, I talk to you about my own research and what I learned. Uh, the relationship, it is not always as clear as it could be, but it's my attempt to continue to bring discovery into this discussion. And then what's most important to me is to use that information uh, that we learn from biological systems to understand human nature, to understand the behavior of organizations, and how can we use that information to be better. Well, we're going to continue on those traditions today. It's not going to be very different. So I hope you had a great summer. I had you, hope you had an opportunity to enjoy family and friends and be ready for what's supposed to be a very interesting year. On this day, back in 1857, Charles Darwin, who was 48 years old, sends a letter to a Harvard botanist called Asa Gray. At that time, nobody knew about the Darwinian concepts or natural selection. He sent that letter describing he was still looking for people to give him feedback about this theory. It was very novel. He was uncertain about it. And he learned through those uh, interactions that there was another man called Alfred Wallace who may have come up with the same theory independently. And because of that information, Charles Darwin decided to end 20 years of indecision and submit his publication to ensure that his name was in history defining a new theory of natural selection, which is interesting because today we'll talk about how stressors or stimulants may change the behavior of organisms through, in this case, genetic manipulation, but in other ways uh, to make us worse or better. On this day also, back in 1902, 1902 was the death of Rudolf Virchow. Now, everybody knows Rudolf Virchow. Dr. Virchow was the father of cellular pathology. But remember that one of his key um, theories of understanding was that environmental challenges and stressors actually predispose people or actually affected the way people address disease, particularly in those days, infectious disease. So a lot of these historical uh, uh, findings and information inform us today and certainly inform this ground rounds. Jason has told me how to work on this, so let's see. As I mentioned before, I like to talk about biology because I think that understanding genes, cells, and animals helps us a little bit better understand people, groups, and organizations. And that's why in 2010, we talked about lung development, lung branching morphogenesis. And we talked about the concept that function follows structure. 
that we mentioned, if you were here, you will remember, we talked about four concepts, growth, pattern formation, specialization, and maturation. And we move those concepts into how do they relate to a growing department, a group of specialists, how we mature as an organization to be better. In 2011, thanks to Dr. K, I don't know if Dr. K is here, I brought you this beautiful picture. We talked about aging. We moved from lung development to the aging process and how that could inform a department to ensure that the department remained young and fresh. And we talked about different concepts, resilience, efficiency, innovation, moving, concepts that today you would think, well, they're, we know that. But it wasn't until this discussion that you start applying it to the day-to-day -day, uh, decision-making that we do to improve the department. Last year, we talked about transitional remodeling, this concept of our moving uh, a place into a different stage to accommodate a new challenge. And, and I brought you this, this quote, which I still think it's interesting. Life is pleasant, death is peaceful, it's a transition that's troublesome. I like that. So we talked about that, and today will be no different. We're going to talk about stressors and stimulants, the department's approach to the challenges of the day. And many of the concepts that I'm going to discuss today are not new concepts. You know them. What I want you to do is to apply them and not forget them during times of good and bad. So let's talk about these concepts. If you take a cell or an organ and you expose it to a challenge, several things may happen, but at least two of them will happen. One is that the challenge may be such that the cell may not be able to sustain itself and undergo apoptosis and move on to death. If the challenge is severe, it will be necrosis and it still will be death. On the other hand, if the challenge is is of a different nature, it might end up for the cell to readjusting itself for growth, for resistance. We see that in, in the cancer systems. Um, but we see that in, in multiple organisms. We see that in bacteria when there's pressure for antibiotics. So the challenge pretty much determines what happens here. Now think about individuals and organizations. You expose an individual organization to a number of challenges. The challenge may be such that you decline in function, you may actually disappear. Or you take that challenge a different way, and depending on culture and attitudes and resources, you may actually grow and become more efficient because of that. These are simple concepts. We know them. They are true for biological systems. They are true for organizations. So it's important to distinguish them. Andrew Bernstein said, we need to distinguish between stress and stimulation. Having deadlines, setting goals, pushing yourself to perform at capacity are stimulating. Stress is when you're anxious, upset, frustrated, which dramatically reduces your ability to perform. So we need to distinguish what are we exposed to. And better yet, and the position I'm bringing to you today is that we define whether a challenge is a stressor or a stimulant, not the challenge itself. Now think about the challenges that we were exposed to last year on this very day. I discussed the following. UOP was still in evolution. We didn't know if it was going to bring efficiency or transparency. We didn't know if it was sustainable. ULH and Jewish Hospital had engaged into a joint operating agreement. It was unclear what this Kentucky One Health thing would look like. We still have those challenges, no? Is this clinical integration going to work? What, what does that look like? We had new School of Medicine leadership. We were uncertain. Does the new dean have an interesting agenda that will change the way we behave? Education. LCME had not visited us yet. We didn't know if innovation was possible in education here with the growing number of students and our limited resources. RRC duty hours. I remember standing here and that very month, Barbara Casper had given me a form saying that we were over 90 hours beyond our threshold for duty hours or we were at risk. Electronic records. We were just starting. I had been on the electronic record for two or three months and there were questions whether it would improve efficiency but clearly decrease efficiency initially and probably decrease billings and affects our revenue. And of course, there was the overarching but also ever-present challenge of the economy and healthcare reform. And what I'm asking you today is to think, were they stressors or were they stimulants? I think last year, if I asked every one of you which one was it, I would have a single answer from everyone in this group. And what I'm, chained, what I'm asking you today is to rethink that. Rethink that. Now, a couple of other concepts. 
If you take a cell and you expose it to a certain challenge, let's call it challenge X, you will get a reaction. Let's call that reaction X. If you expose the same cell or organism to another challenge, you will get a different reaction. And what that tells us is that the response of a cell is dependent on the challenge. Whatever, hap whatever happens, it depends on the challenge. However, if you expose another cell to the same challenge, you may very much get a very different reaction. So it's not just the challenge. And in fact, I would argue that the host, the person, the individual, the cell exposed to the challenge is really what determines what the outcome would be. But there's a third concept here that we forget all the time. And that is that I can't tell if that challenge is a stressor or a stimulant until I see the outcome. If I stress the organism with a certain challenge and that organism grows and does better and it's more efficient, happier, then I would say that's a stimulant. If I do the opposite and I find that that organism dies and that was not what we wanted, then we know that was a stressor. You cannot tell whether a challenge is a stressor or a stimulant until you wait for the outcome. We predict the outcome all the time. In fact, that's our job, to ensure that we don't make decisions without careful discussion and before careful thought about what's going to happen. But in the end, we do not know. And experience is great, but outcome is the ultimate decision. So whether our challenges of 2012 were stimulants or stressors, at that time, you couldn't tell, and I couldn't either. Hopefully, I will answer that question for you today. So what do we learn from this? Environmental challenges may lead to extinction or drive to efficiency. The response is determined by the host as much as by the challenge. And whether a challenge is a stressor or a stimulant is determined by the outcome. We cannot determine it a priori. You agree with me so far? Or at least you follow me so far? OK. Now, these simple biological concepts relate to organizations. To me, external challenges may lead to extension or drive to efficiency. The response is determined by the individual and the organization as much as by the challenge, systems, cultures, uh, attitudes, whether we have an electronic record or not, resources. How do we address a challenge is very important. Whether a challenge is a stressor or a stimulant is determined by the outcome. Not by what you think. It's by the outcome. Therefore, we should avoid treating every potential stressor as such. If every time we're approached by a challenge, we get all stressed out and we consider a stressor and we predict that we're going to die, <laughs> you'll never get anywhere. And therefore, we may work. We well, want to consider working towards turning every challenge into a stimulant. We don't know the outcome, but we have a choice. So let's talk a little bit about this as it relates to medicine. I mean, these issues about predicting outcomes and how do we treat these, these things and what do we do in medicine. And, and I want to bring the concept of antioxidant because oxidant stress will be the part of the second um, phase of this talk. And it's about the myth of antioxidants. I found this article by a science writer, Melinda Moyer, who wrote an article in this February in Scientific American about antioxidants. I'm not going to read it. I'm going to read it to you because I think it makes a very strong point. For decades, researchers assumed that highly reactive molecules called free radicals, clearly a stressor, clearly, caused aging by damaging cells and thus undermining the functioning of tissues and organs. You're exposed to free radicals. That's bad. Recent experiments, however, show that increases in certain free radicals in mice and worms correlate with longer lifespan. What? Indeed, in some circumstances, free radicals seem to signal cellular repair networks. It might be a good thing. If these results are confirmed, they may suggest that taking antioxidants, tell that to my wife, in the form of vitamins or other supplements can do more harm than good in otherwise healthy individuals. And there were two interesting slides that she presented. But their concept was that a challenge, in this case free radicals, we made the decision that it was a stressor. And we decided to act by attacking it. And what we found was a bad outcome. Indeed, was that a stressor? Or was it a stimulant that needed to be nurtured? So these are some of the data. I couldn't uh, expand this further, so I don't want you 
even if you wanted to. I, I don't expect you to read this, but the point is that these were studies that she presented in her publication where they took heavy smokers and looked at the incidence of cancer for years, and they noted that in people taking antioxidants versus placebo, there was no difference. But in the same smokers who were exposed to asbestos, actually the ones taking antioxidants, apologize for that, actually had a higher incidence of cancer. The ones taking antioxidants had a higher incidence of cancer. And they looked and a 2007 article that actually took a whole number of articles, about 47 articles, and joined the data and did a meta-analysis on it and evaluated whether lifespan or mortality was affected by the use of antioxidants. They found a 5% increase in mortality. When you look at all these papers together, 5% increase in mortality if you take antioxidants. And it was later related to the use of beta-carotene, vitamin A, vitamin E. So friends, I don't know what this means yet. And I wouldn't would run to the store now to take action. But what this tells me, maybe we've made the decision of what's a stressor and a stimulant without waiting for the outcome. That's what science is all about. It's about trying to define outcomes before we pass it on to humans. Mm -hmm. The other piece of this presentation was in worms. Because C. elegans know best. No? And what they did is they took these worms and genetically manipulated them so they could express a lot of reactive oxidants. And what they found is that this is the lifespan, survival in days, of a worm. I did not know that a worm lasted about 30 days. Did you? <laughs> okay, if I knew that, I wouldn't be so worried in my house. I would just let them be, wait 30 days, it's done. <laughs> so the blue is that. If you gave, if you genetically manipulated them to produce more antioxidants, they actually, I'm sorry, to produce more free oxygen radicals, they actually live longer. And if you gave them antioxidants, they went back to the normal life. So I don't know you, but this data has me worried. Because I have a home, a little pack of vitamins and stuff, and men's uh, whatever that my wife buys to me, and every day I kind of pop one in. Well, I tell her I pop one in anyway. Uh, now I have a choice and am able to sit down with my wife and explain the data and say, I don't know if this is a good thing or not. <laughs> huh? So based on that data, I want you to look back at the challenges. Is UOP a good thing or is it a stressor? Is ULH and the Kentucky One Health Alliance a good thing? Is it a stressor or a stimulant? School of Medicine Dean, I, don't, I think we know the answer to that. It's a great stimulant. Education, what happened with innovation? What are we going to do with the RC rules? <laughs> Electronic record, was that a stress or a stimulant? We, so I want you to begin to think about this, but your answer should be, well, Dr. Roman, I don't want to think about it until you show me the outcome. And I will show you that. But before I show you that, I want to pull back a little bit. Let's shift gears, okay? Let's just start anew. Let me tell you a little bit about research and what I learned about that. And it has some relationship to what we're discussing today. And it's about oxygen stress and nicotinic receptors in lung. You've heard me talk about these concepts before. I mentioned to you about taking oxidants. Why do people take oxidants? Well, because we produce antioxidants, because we produce a lot of oxygen stress. No, through NADPH, glutathione transport may be affected. Uh, we produce a lot of free radicals, oxygen and nitrogen. Um, or we may have oxidation of thiol disulfide pairs. And that's something I want to talk to you today. Because Dean Jones and others have put forward this concept of redox signaling and cessing through redox potential. Redox potential. So I take Dr. Cloaker, who's sitting right in front of me, and Dr. Julio Ramirez, and I take their blood out and measure their cysteine, 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 cysteine amount, and I plug it into this equation, the nurse equation, and I can come up with a redox potential for Dr. Cloaker. And I can come up with a redox potential for Dr. Ramirez. And that redox potential may be reduced or may be oxidized, but they're not dying. There's nothing wrong with them. And the question is, what does it mean for them to have different redox potentials after 30 years? We don't know that. But I'm hopeful that both of them have a cysteine-cysteine redox potential of about minus 80 millivolts. I am hopeful. Come to me later, gentlemen. <laughs> because if not, 
that will be abnormal. And yet, I'm making that up without understanding outcome. But we think this is normal based on Dean Jones' work and a lot of other people who actually have looked at many, many uh, individuals and have defined this as the normal ratio. What's most interesting is that Dean Jones and his colleagues have also suggested that oxidation of this redox potential is associated with disease. I didn't say it leads to disease. I said it's associated with disease. So if you are aging, we're all aging, but if you're older, if you take, don't take antioxidants, if you take a bad diet with low cysteine, if you are an alcoholic, if you have type 2 diabetes, if you smoke, if you have atherosclerosis, if you have undergone chemotherapy and BMT, lung transplantation, if you have all these conditions, this needle starts moving to the right. And to the right means more oxidized. And you're moving from minus 80 millivolts to minus 20 millivolts in, in cysteine cysteine. Or if you look at this bottom number, that relates to glutathione. And because of these data, this group has felt that, you know, this might be a reasonable marker of someone walking around oxidized and therefore someone predisposed for these conditions or can influence these conditions in a bad way. But Dean will be the first to say, but I'm not sure because we do not know the outcome. These are simply associations. Well, maybe we can begin to address this. The first thing we did is we said, well, how does the lung behave with this? And we took lung cells. We took lung fibroblasts and exposed them to these different uh, redox potential, minus 46 being very oxidized, minus 31, 131 being very reduced. And we said, is it a stimulant or a stressor? Were they proliferated better? Fibroblasts proliferated better. Is that a stimulant or a stressor? If you're regenerating a lung after pneumonectomy, this may be a great thing. If you have fibrosis, this may be a bad thing. So it depends on the host and where they are, no? But we said, well, how about matrix production? Fibronectin is a molecule you've heard a lot when I talk. It's a matrix molecule that we use to evaluate whether an, an, an organism has been injured or not. And what we find is that the more oxidized the fibroblast is, the more fibronectin it makes. We found the same thing for TG beta, which is a pro-fibrotic growth factor, but it's also an anti-inflammatory agent. It's also an anti-inflammatory agent. And we found that for myofibroblast trans differentiation. So we don't know what this is yet. But we decided to look at this further. How does this happen? How do cells understand the redox potential? If Getz is walking around with a wrong redox potential or an oxidized redox potential, how does a cell know that? How does a cell understand that that is what's happening? How does signal and sensing happen? So we looked at fibronectin. It's a glycoprotein that we've discussed, we've discussed before. It's a multi-domain glycoprotein that is associated with disulfide bonds in the carboxytonal domain. And if you put cells on top of a culture dish and you get rid of the cells and then stain for the matrix 24, 48 hours later, you see this matrix form of fibronectin. And we know today that it's a sensitive marker of lung injury. It's a sensitive marker of lung injury, and every injury that I know is associated with increased fibronectin. You can cut yourself right now, and I know there's fibronectin there. However, it's also involved in the repair process. It's important for vascularization. It's important for clotting if you're bleeding. It's important for cell differentiation. It's important for endogenesis. If you get rid of fibronectin or its receptor during conception, you do not develop stressor or stimulant, and it can modulate inflammation. Well, what we decided to do is to look at how cells behave and respond to redox potential. And again, as I told you before, when you look at fibronectin expression, oxidized redox potential induces fibronectin. We said, well, that's a simple model. So you start throwing things in the system and see if something inhibits. It wasn't that disorganized. By that time, we were working on nicotine receptors. You know that I talked to you about that before. And we decided to throw this snake venom on it and it's alpha toxin. And this snake venom is specific for certain nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So all of a sudden, we find out this and we say, wow, this snake venom that inhibits nicotinic receptors inhibits the response to this redox potential. Are cells sensing the redox potential through nicotinic receptors? Does this have a larger implication? Remember that in pharmacology, we call things based on the first experiment. These are called nicotinic receptors because they were found to 
interact with nicotine. But is that the reason of their purpose in life? Or is it to sense oxygen stress? So basically, we started looking at these nicotine receptors because alpha beta toxin inhibits both of them. The alpha 4, beta 2, which you know, because when you treat patients for smoking cessation, there's a drug out there, Chantix, that binds to this particular receptor. Okay? So we already are starting to use this knowledge to impact people. And this other receptor, which is most common in the body, and you see that there's five units of this. Some of them are homodimers, some of them are heterodimers, but these are all inhibited. And the question is, how does this work? So our idea is that perhaps there are certain challenges that induce oxidation of this redox potential in the cells through nicotinic receptors, I'm not saying that's the only way, can sense this and produce fibronectin, but perhaps other responses. Are you following me so far? So how do these nicotinic receptors work? Well, they're channels, okay, and they allow cations to move through. So the nicotine, for example, binds to the ligand binding site on the extracellular domain of this receptor, tweaks the receptor, the receptor changes a little bit, its conformations opens the pore, and in goes the ions and induces central suction, gene differential expression, and things happen. Things happen. How does oxidative stress work? Because it's not really a ligand. I can't isolate oxidative stress on a column chromatography. How, do I, how does this cell sense this? And could other things that cause oxidative stress do this? Or could other things do this? So this is ethanol. I just saw the group of the GI group coming from upstairs in Bunch from their conference. They deal with alcohol abuse all the time. No, they don't deal with that. They deal with patients who are affected by alcohol abuse all the time, and that affects their liver. And notice fibronectin expression in fibroblasts is affected by alcohol, and it's also inhibited by alpha beta toxin. And it turns out what happens is that alcohol is sensed. I'm not saying that it binds like a ligand but it's sensed by cells through a certain nicotinic receptors, just the same as nicotine is sensed by the cells by a different nicotine receptors, and who knows what else? And who knows what else? So we know now that it's alpha-4 nicotinic receptors because we expose the cells to alcohol. There's an induction of this receptor of expression. This is mRNA expression for this particular receptor, not others. Also, because we get an inhibitor of this particular receptor, and as you can see, fibronectin is induced with ethanol, but is not induced when you add bongata toxin, the snake venom I've talked to you before, but also a chemical inhibitor that inhibits this particular receptor. And the other thing we've done is that we have now silenced the cell, so we can downregulate the expression of that receptor, and we can inhibit the response, but not when we do it with controls. And we can inhibit the proliferation, because ethanol induces proliferation on cells, stressor or stimulant, and we can inhibit that through that receptor. So we know that it's this particular receptor here. So it's interesting because now we know that alcohol, nicotine, redox potential changes, all these things can be sensed by these nicotine receptors, probably because alcohol and tobacco exposure and other challenges induce alterations in the redox potential. And is the redox potential the ultimate determinant of what happens? Why do we say that? Well, we said that because it was very difficult to understand how does the receptor interact with oxygen stress. And it turns out that these receptors, like many surface ground proteins, are very interesting because they have very interesting strategically located cysteines. So if I can hit them with oxidants like acetaldehyde or other oxidants, these cysteines will change. How do we test this? How do we test the fact that it's these cysteines that are affected by the redox potential and that that changes the conformation of the receptor induces signaling? What we decided to do is to mutate some of these cysteines. And this is work by Jefferson, Tyler, and others in the laboratory. So basically what do we do? We take the fibroblast, they have the wild-type receptor, and then we add shRNA, and now we make cells that don't express the receptor. The cells live. In fact, they're animals that are mutant for alpha-4 receptors, and they live, so this doesn't kill them. And then we add a transfected mutant receptor that doesn't have a particular cysteine. And we say, well, how does that work then? Would that work? And first you need to show 
that these cells express to the receptor on the surface. So here are cells that do, these are different clones that this is very early on, but show that there's less and less of the wild type receptor when they express more of the mutant receptor. And if you look at by facts analysis, there's a shifting to the right of the curve, which suggests this receptor is actually expressed on the surface of the cell. We can now proceed with testing. And here's a test. Now, this is a complicated slide, which I have narrowed the bars because this is RNA, but this is looking at, did I go backward? This is looking at uh, certain of these graphs. But important thing is that ethanol induces fibronectin expression compared to control. When I bring the alpha-4 down, it doesn't do so much. This is this finding here. But what's important about this slide is that when you mutate three of those cysteines, if you mutate one of them, nothing happens. But if you mutate two others, things are inhibited. And that suggests that indeed this receptor can respond to alcohol, nicotine, and redox potential. We have some more data that I don't have time to present to you today. Because these cysteines are strategically located, and when they're affected by oxygen stress, the receptor changes conformation, and now it starts firing. Does that make sense? So, so what, Dr. Roman? So Dr. Cloker just left because he realized his redox potential was very low, and he was taking antioxidants, and he's going to change his life. Mm -hmm. I would argue that Dr. Cloker should come back. Julio doesn't care. Okay. I would ask Dr. Cloker back because we can now change this by diet. We don't need a pill. We can change it by diet. Because Dean Jones and colleagues have shown that if you add a different diet to an animal, you can alter the redox potential. These are mice that were exposed to regular chow or diets with different concentration of sulfur amino acids. And he can show that the redox potential may be more reduced or more oxidized. Remember, more positive, more oxidized. More negative, um, more reduced. And this is data generated by our group, but also Bert Watson, who's sitting over here, who's now obtained an HPLC and done all the work to kind of help us with this work to measure redox potential in the plasma of these animals. But we can manipulate the redox potential of animals and potentially of people. And so who cares, Dr. Roman? Well, it, I care. Because if I oxidize the animal, I increase fibronectin expression, and I increase TJ beta. And therefore, I predict that if I reduce the animal with a diet, I would decrease fibronectin expression and decrease this as well. Is that a good thing? I do not know. I think it will be a good thing, but I've learned to understand that I don't know if it's a stressor or a stimulant. Now, what have we learned about this? Well, we've learned that whether a challenge is a stressor or a stimulant is determined by the outcome. And since we don't know the ultimate outcome, we know the outcome out of experiment. We don't know the outcome in humans. We can't tell. Therefore, we must wait for the outcome to determine what effect the challenge will have. And better yet, let's treat every challenge as a stimulant. We have a choice. So let's move on how we interpret the challenges of the past with the outcome of today. So look at these. These are the challenges that I mentioned to you now for the third time. And every time you see them, I know some of you squirm in your seats. Because mm -hmm. these were stressors to you. Well, are they stressors? Because remember, it's about the outcome. Well, let's say in the research arena. Well, we have now more revenue. This is in millions of dollars. We have now moved the NIH ranking from 50 to 44. The NIH ranking for 2013 is unknown. The lower number is better. And it's the best of all departments of medicine in this region, I would add. And publications have gone up. Is it a stressor or a stimulant? Well, these data, these outcome data to me, suggest that we were stimulated to do better in research by these stressors. How about education? Well. We have high satisfaction scores. I don't know that they're better. We've done very well, thanks to Barbara's group. But, you know, we're doing well. I think that we're better. Past board rates, 100% this year. What was it before, Barb? Uh, 89. 89. What is the average? 86. 86 of the nation. We were doing OK. We were 89. 100% last year. Resident placement continues to be 100%. Duty hour violations, last year over 90. Now it's less than 15. I noticed that I have not asked Barbara and her team the data for the last month, so this may have changed. But as of two months ago, 
at least nobody's knocking on my door. So if you look at these outcomes, I have to conclude that we were stimulated to do better. How about in the clinical arena? Well, the UOP and the electronic record induce transparency. Oh, my God, yes. And I can't bring you all the data in this slide. But we are identifying things that we would never have identified before. Good, but also bad, because transparency. The division chiefs now get a budget every, every month that relate to UOP as well as the consolidated budget related to the university. We're starting to identify problems. And when we identify problems, we start considering a stressor. When, in fact, the identification of that problem would have not been possible a year ago. Stressor or stimulant. Look at the revenue. 77 million in 2011. 89.5 million dollars today. We've been increasing. And in fact, if I were to include the ARA deal that Barbara, that Barbara, that Eleanor Letter and others developed, and thanks to their effort, I would add this to 102 million. This is a 102 million dollar department. Much more than what it was in 2011. Stressor or stimulant? UOP alone in the clinic, we are expected this year to bring $3 million more than what we did last year. Now, we haven't changed a lot what we do. I must believe that it's because the junior faculty that we have been bringing is now getting more revenue for their efforts, but also because there's some efficiency with electronic record and UOP and lumping in uh, economies of scale. I don't know the actual reason for this, but it is an outcome and it is a stimulant. How about uh, this, new programs? If you were under stress all the time, you couldn't develop new programs, not that many. We have a new rheumatology division. Just a year ago, we had nobody, but well, we had Dr. Edwards, who was fantastic. But we have a division, not only a division, but before, where is the head of rheumatology? He, he usually sits up front, so he must be out of town. But before um, Dr. Roberts came in, he actually sent the paperwork for the fellowship, and it got approved. I have the letter on my desk. So he will now, within the next few months, we'll have a fellowship and a division that we have been waiting for for about a decade. We have a new program on interventional pulmonology with two interventional pulmonologists, more than, more than most places in the United States, and a fellowship. And a new fellow will start this month, if it's not already here. A world-class GI motility program. GI lost a GI motility person and said, well, who cares? We'll bring a world-class GI motility guy, and we'll restart this, and we'll get Jewish to help us with this. And they did. Stressor or stimulant. We have an academic auto. <laughs> an academic model of critical care at Jewish hospital. My own fellows, my own faculty in pulmonary medicine said that is not possible, Dr. Roman. Jewish hospital is a different kind of place. There is no way you will ever have a unit with an attending and a fellow and people working there that is closed, that intensive is driven, and today we do. It's not perfect, but Jewish hospital has agreed on the auto <laughs> and is moving in that direction for a CCU that will open in October, for a thoracic surgical unit, and for a neuro ICU. Stimulant or stressor? We have here the extension of the cardiology group into Jewish hospital, and they can give you all the numbers, but they're tremendous numbers of what they're doing in EP and other studies that suggest that they're, they're taking over. Don't say this outside of this room. But they've also expanded away from Louisville to southern Indiana, okay? And they have a strong group over there. They're letting them know who we are, and that crossing that bridge is worthwhile doing. Stressor or stimulant. Global Health Initiative. Julio is still here. Betts hasn't come back. But Julio has decided that he's no longer going to have just an HIV clinic and a little travel clinic and maybe doing a little vaccination. He's going to develop a global health initiative. Why? Because the patients deserve it, but also our students and our trainees and our faculty demand it. They want to be exposed to an initiative that exposes them to global and international health. And Julio is moving that forward. And Rodney Falls has now been formally defined as the director of the disease management program for the employees at UofL. So that employees at UofL can be followed more closely if they have COPD, if they have diabetes, if they have renal failure, if they have um, depression. Because we know that close follow-up of those subgroups 
decreases hospitalizations and costs, UOP benefits, but most importantly, our patients benefit. You can't do this by being stressed out all the time. Number one, I mean, number seven or six, I don't know now. How about faculty? We continue to grow. There were 140 faculty when I arrived. There are now 204. Haven't asked Jerry for the latest numbers since uh, a few days ago. Promotions, 13 promotions this year for the year before. I don't know, guys. You tell me. You tell me. Actually, don't tell me. Does Justin Soy stressed out? ACP just named it the most outstanding student. Where's Justin? Justin is not here because he's tired of seeing me. I, I serve as his mentor, and Justin is fantastic. We hope to keep him here. How about Ali Smith, the most outstanding PGY2? How about Kelly McCann's faculty award? This is the ACP. This is not the U of L ACP. This is the ACP deciding that our people deserve these awards. Tom Dew's 2013 top doc for ACP hospitalists. Top doc. I don't know what you think about these things. I don't know what you feel about this, but I hope you feel the sense of pride that I do, that despite the challenges of the day, we decided to turn them into stimulants. How about these guys? Julio Ramirez, still here. Presidential award from the European Respiratory Society for his efforts in infections and pneumonia. This is not the U of L group. This is not the ACP. This is an international society giving him a presidential award. Tara Schapmeyer, I'm just giving you one award. I think I received data for two, where she received from the American Cancer Society a care award for her efforts in taking care of patients and educating patients with cancer. Gets Cloaker, Gets, you left, and you won the Health Advocacy Award from the seven counties. How about Mark Rostein, the Louis Brandeis Privacy Award from an organization that I didn't know much about, but I've learned that has a lot of impact called the Friendship Privacy Rights Organization. How about Dr. Roberto Boli, who's I, I can keep on filling forms about this, but this year he wins one of the highest, if not the highest, research achievement by the American Heart Association. <laughs> so one person that I forgot to put on the list, Thorsten Lucan. Where's Thorsten? Thorsten, are you here? He's probably in the ICU somewhere. Thorsten Lucan is one of our residents. He won two, not one, two Young Investigator Awards from the Southern Society for Clinical Investigation. This is not the University of Louisville. This is an organization that incorporates over 20 departments of medicine throughout the Southeast who chose Thorsten twice as their Young Investigator Award, stressor or stimulant. So I'm going to leave you with some conclusions and finish so we can have some discussion. First of all, the challenges identified for 2012 turn out to be stimulants. You may think differently. Show me the data because my data does not say so. They stimulated our program to grow its clinical and research enterprises to enhance its educational program, and to promote faculty development. They did. That's what the data suggests. But not everything is perfect. Not everything is perfect. Despite we being a $102 million department, we have a $4 million deficit. Why? Because integration into UOP prevented us from obtaining $2 million through the first few months because of logistical issues and because we had to pay a number of commitments to ensure that our legacy corporation, UMA, was terminated appropriately, and it did. And because we continue to grow and we're a non-for-profit organization, we invest every cent we have in our programs. So we don't make an extra buck. So for every dollar we bring in, we reinvest back, so our expenses continue the same. It won't be until we bring dollars that we don't use or we don't invest into anything else that we'll get rid of the deficit, and we're working on that, so we'll make that happen. We need space to accommodate new programs. Everybody in this room is ready to develop a new program. You've seen that. We need space to do that. We need resources to continue to grow. We need to expose more students and residents to meaningful research experiences, and we need to improve efficiency in the clinical arena. We've got to do better in building. We've got to do better in care delivery. We've got to do better in staffing. We know that. But today, I hope you come out of this room saying, we know this, and it's not a stressor. It is a challenge, and we're going to fight it. So what are the stressors for this year? Kentucky One Health, we still don't know what it's going to look like. We still don't know what it's going to look like. Will that integration work or not? Well, I choose to take it as a great challenge for us to get better. We have a deficit. We'll have to figure out how to come that up. RVUs, the faculty are, oh my god. What do we do with RVUs? The whole world is moving to RVUs because it's a better way to define 
what you are doing. It's a better way to define that. So don't worry about the implications to your practice. Don't worry about your salary. If you do your job, that's not going to be affected. But it helps me come back to hospitals and the dean and other organizations say, here's the amount of work we do. I'm not just telling you we're at the clinic. Here's how many hundreds of thousands of RVUs are done by my department every year. We deserve that investment. Contracts. Will we get the contracts we need to serve the different hospitals? We will. University of Kentucky. Maybe you haven't thought about that. University of Kentucky now has a new hospital, a new NCI designated center, and a new CTSA. Where do you think they're going to go for new talent? I know where I would. I know where the talent is. It's in this room. That's a challenge. Okay? But it's not a stressor. It's not a stressor. There's plenty of reasons to stay here. So let me finish with this slide. Our vision is to become the top academic internal medicine program in the region. Why do I always bring that slide? Because if you understand the vision, if you understand where the organization is heading, then it's easy to make decisions, and it's easy to interpret and adjust to the stressors or challenges of the day. If you know where the end point is, you always can make decisions based on the challenges you're approached to to go in the direction you need to go to. The vision is crucial. And that vision doesn't change by resources, and it doesn't change by the chair, and it doesn't change by the faculty moving in this room. This organization have decided that this is where we're going to be, and we move in that direction. So final point, a quote from JR. Challenges will come and go. The response to a challenge is genetically determined for cells and small organisms. Humans, on the other hand, have a choice. Their choice is to run away from or cave under the pressure and weight of a stressor and or the choice to reject the above and turn every challenge into a powerful tool for growth. You have demonstrated to me, particularly Dr. Cloaker, has demonstrated to me. <laughs> let, me let me be serious now. You have demonstrated to me that you have chosen to interpret those challenges as stimulants. And I am forever grateful. Thank you. We have 10 more minutes. Questions, comments, ideas, rebuttals. Everybody's comfortable or uncomfortable with what I said. Any comments, any questions? Yes. Dr. Renninger, thank you for coming for this lecture. I assume that this is the fourth tradition, that Dr. Renninger will be sitting in that chair for years to come, and that pleases this group. So thank you for being here. What else? What do you think the Kentucky one Health Alliance is going to look like? What do I think the Kentucky One Health Alliance is going to look like? How that alliance will look like will be very much shaped with what we decide is our vision and what we decide that choice should look like. The reason, remember why we joined Kentucky One Health. It wasn't because we thought it was the greatest idea. Have you seen Argo? It was the worst, best idea we could come up with. No? Why? We needed the resources. If this organization was to grow at the same level it grew for the past 10 years, which was one of the top in NIH moving, ranking organizations. If it was to move at that same place, if it was to continue to support these programs, we couldn't do it alone. So you have a choice. You stay where you are, or you partner with someone who can contribute resources so you can move at the same speed or faster. Now that brings some challenges, cultural challenges. This is a private organization. Kentucky One Health is drum, ran by a group in Denver. They own 90 uh, private hospitals. Culture shock will be quite significant. And they have something clear in mind. They want to serve patients, but they also need revenue. And they also have certain objectives that are very unique to them and that are very different the, to the academic model. So we have the choice of interjecting the information and the things that they need to understand what is our model and how we come up with a joint model that fits their needs and ours. So my vision for Kentucky One Health is that Kentucky One Health has already decided that we're going to become a virtual academic 
uh, program in downtown for Kentucky One Health, for C Catholic Health Inc. Kentucky One Health would be a virtual academic model. That word academic, they inserted it, not me, but that tells me they're understanding that this is crucial for us, that education is crucial, that research is crucial, that good patient care is crucial, that taking care of indigent population is crucial, and that we're not going to let go of that no matter who's our partner. And in the affiliation agreement, all of that was described. So people will come to you with decisions and ideas and concepts that are based on what they know best. But you know what academia is about, and you challenge it, and you discuss it, and you come up with a fair, happy medium that will address that. In the end, we will see more clinical programs. In the end, we will have better educational opportunities that people can choose. In the end, we will be able to attract other physicians who would otherwise have not come here without those resources. So I think this will end up being a stimulant. But for now, I know that everybody's a little stressed out about it. But only the outcome will tell. So don't make up your mind. I'm convinced it will be a stimulant. Another question. ULP, thanks for asking that question. <laughs> ULP is now 15 departments strong. One department still remains behind. We'll be coming in at the end of this year. But now we are a unified uh, enterprise with a single electronic record, at least in, in the HOC area. Um, and billing systems are not uh, unified yet. And all the things are, are still changing. We still don't know what's going to happen with UOP. But all this data suggests that we're moving in the right direction. We're identifying a lot of issues, a lot of problems. Uh, that is understood for a new corporation that is a $120, 150000000 million corporation was just created in this place a year ago. You expect that that's going to happen with no problems? The Dr. Robert Woodruff or the people who invented Coca-Cola just said the next day we're going to have Coca-Cola and it's going to be fine? No. We're going through growing pains. But in the end, it will be a stimulant. The data is already there. Thank you all. Enjoy your day.